So I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today about the exciting plans that we have to investigate sleep in discovery. I'll start by talking a bit about sleep in general. Uh, next, we'll talk about um, what the effects are of not getting enough sleep and how um, we need to try and answer important questions in sleep in RBD and PD. We'll then look at how technology might help us to answer the questions. And finally, we'll discuss future plans with respect to discovery and how you might have the chance to be involved if you'd like to. So perhaps the first thing to think about when we're talking about sleep is what is normal sleep. Um, in the animal kingdom, at one extreme, are giraffes that sleep for just over four and a half hours a day. And at the other end are little brown bats that can sleep for up to 20 hours a day. In the middle are humans um, that sleep for different amounts of time during their lives. Babies sleep for around 14 to 15 hours a day. And in general, as people get older, the amount of sleep dwindles. Sleep studies are considered to be the gold standard when it comes to investigating sleep. Lots of wires are attached at different points on the head, and sensors are used to pick up the electrical signals that are produced when brain cells send messages to each other. It can take around an hour to put on all of the sensors, and then sleep is typically recorded for a day or two. Um, an individual often has to come into hospital for the sleep study, and then they have to try and sleep in unfamiliar surroundings. And the sleep that they get is often not representative of their sleep at home. After the sleep study has been completed, someone then has to spend a long time analyzing the sleep. Um, here's a graph um, showing an individual's sleep. And you can see that um, there are just different stages of sleep. It can be a bit helpful to think of sleep a bit like diving, in that to start off, you're standing at the surface awake. And then as you dive deeper into different levels of sleep, you pass in and out of different levels of sleep. So as people age, in general, um, the amount of sleep reduces. There's a tendency for older adults to go to bed earlier and also to wake up earlier. There is also a longer amount of time spent waiting to go to sleep whilst lying in bed. And sleep can become more fragmented as people wake up more often in the night. This may be because of greater sensitivity to noises around them, or it may be because of medical problems, which may mean, for example, that they need more frequent trips to the toilet. Overall, there's a reduction in the amount of sleep. However, we still don't really know whether the reduction in the amount of sleep that occurs with aging is because individuals don't need as much sleep as they once did, or whether Older adults are just unable to get the amount of sleep that they need. Sleep is important for a wide range of tasks. And not getting enough sleep can lead to lapses in attention or microsleeps, which, depending on when they occur, can have serious consequences. Shortages of sleep can also lead to changes in hormone levels um, and can lead to craving high-calorie foods, which can put people at risk of weight gain. Not getting enough sleep can also make people irritable and can make it more difficult for them to pick up on emotional cues around them. They may also be more prone to making risky decisions and can find it more difficult to keep the memories that they're trying to make. So several questions um, remain unanswered in RBD and PD when it comes to sleep. The first of which is, how does the structure of sleep differ between people with RBD and PD and controls. Different groups have tried to look at differences in the structure of sleep. For example, looking at differences in the amount of time spent in the lighter and deeper stages of sleep. But so far, different studies have had different results. Some studies have reported differences in the amount of REM sleep um, that, between individuals with RBD and controls. Sleep efficiency, which is the proportion of time spent in bed asleep, has been reported to be reduced in some people with RBD and PD. But there have been sort of contradictory studies which have reported other results which have found no differences in the structure of sleep between people. All of the studies so far um, have relied on sleep studies to take snapshots of sleep in time, often only looking at sleep at a single point in time. This brings us on to the second question, which is, does the structure of sleep in RBD and PD change over time? 
And if so, do differences provide us with information about the condition? In other words, does the way that sleep changes over time allow us to predict how someone with RBD or PD may be affected by the condition itself? And tell us things like if and when someone with RBD may go on to develop PD, how PD is likely to change over time, um, and whether some people might be more vulnerable to developing memory problems than others. We already know from sleep studies involving people with insomnia that the sleep that's captured is not often typical of the sleep at home. And when people have tried to grade how severe RBD was over a two-night study, they've found that the number of episodes they've had have differed on average by a factor of 2.5. To be able to study sleep in detail, we need to really have better ways of studying sleep over longer periods of time so that we do not miss things, rather than taking the snapshots of sleep that we do at the moment. Indeed, some people receive a diagnosis of RBD having never ever had a sleep study. And those that do have sleep studies often never have their sleep studied in detail again. Because we've got um, sleep studies which are so expensive, we don't really have good evidence behind the treatments that we use in RBD. Um, Clonazepam and melatonin are the two main treatments that are recommended for use on the basis of reports that they work. Um, however, for most treatments nowadays, if you're trying to prove that they work, you'd do a randomised trial where around half, as we've heard, of people randomly receive the drug and the other half receive the placebo or the dummy drug. The clinical team's kept in the dark and at the end of the study, when all the assessments have been completed, the results can be compared to look for differences. So in RBD, um, clonazepam has never been looked at in the context of a randomised trial. And so far, there's only been one study involving melatonin in RBD. And in that study, they calculated beforehand that they needed to recruit 10 people to be confident of their results. But actually, they were only able to recruit eight before the study came to a close. So all of the studies carried out so far has kind of been limited by similar features, including recruiting only small numbers of participants, relying only on snapshots in time, and maybe perhaps unsurprisingly, only finding small differences. So the three main questions we'd like to focus on are, how is the structure of sleep different in RBD and PD? Do, do those changes change over time? And how do existing treatments work? In trying to answer our questions, we turn towards advances in technology. And technology is often blamed for worsening sleep with increasing reports of children and even toddlers having problems with their sleep. But some advances have been specifically geared towards trying to help us to understand our sleep and to even improve its quality. Doing a quick Google search reveals multiple results when it comes to sleep aids. And there are many accessories on the market, which include things like sleep lights, which are designed to try and wake people up naturally from sleep. For those who struggle to get out of bed, there are also alarm clocks which, when activated, roll off the side of the table onto the floor and start whizzing around until they're turned off. <laughs> if you've got $2,500 to spare, there are also smart beds which allow for the firmness in the mattress to be adjusted on different sides of the bed along with the temperature. For those of partners that snore, the heads of the bed can also be elevated separately, which might help to relieve it and sensors in the bed can try to give feedback about sleep. Some websites are also available which help people to track their sleep over time, and some even provide the means by which people with insomnia can receive talking therapies to try and help with it. But perhaps the most common way at the moment of trying to track sleep, or one of the most common ways, is with smartphone applications. Sleep time is one such application that relies on motion sensors inside phones to detect the movement when the phones are placed on the bed at night. Though it's popular, there's not really that much evidence that it can do what it says that it can do. And in a small study that looked at around 20 people who used the app whilst they were having sleep studies, there was no link between the amount of time taken to fall asleep, measures of sleep efficiency, or the amount of time spent in the lighter or deeper stages of sleep. 
It's perhaps unsurprising that a phone might struggle to stage sleep because it can't really be expected to tell the difference between movement that occurs as someone's lying in bed in the process of falling asleep with movement that occurs during sleep itself. And equally, um, in real life, a phone can't really be expect to tell the, expected to tell the difference between one person's movement from that of their partner or even their dog. <laughs> So the same considerations have to be applied when it comes to wearable motion trackers, which are increasingly being used to monitor sleep. Again, small-scale studies have compared different wearable motion trackers against sleep studies, and in general, they've found to provide fairly good e estimates of the total amount of sleep that people have. However, when it comes to estimating sleep efficiency, or again, the amount of time spent in the lighter or deeper stages of sleep, the estimates are fairly poor. To be able to study sleep in detail um, and to be able to tell apart different stages of sleep, we really need to be able to use brainwave monitors to tell us what the brain is doing. These are just starting to be released commercially and different monitors have been designed for different purposes. So some have been designed to try and replace sleep studies, um, but their design perhaps might make it difficult to imagine their use outside of the hospital environment. Others have been designed to provide feedback for meditation or even to enhance a video gaming experience. There are some, though, that have been specifically designed to try and monitor sleep and to even improve it um, over time. And the things that need to be considered when choosing a monitor are how accurate is it, how practical and comfortable is it to wear over longer periods of time, um, and is it cost effective to allow its widespread use. So that brings us to the main question, which is, what is OPDC doing to improve your sleep? Um, well, the project's been a long time in the making, but we're working with different groups to use wearable devices to study sleep in RBD and PD. And we plan to use a combination of wearable devices, including a brainwave monitor to help stage sleep, a fingertip sensor to look for differences in oxygen levels and pulse during sleep, and a smartwatch to detect movement in sleep. Well, the plan is to compare the combination of wearable devices against sleep studies to see how well they work and then to use them to study sleep in people with RBD and PD um, at home over seven days and then over time to see how it changes. We'd also like to use the wearable devices to study the effects of medication on sleep so that in the future it might be possible to target particular treatments towards particular parts of sleep that may benefit from it. So where are we at at the moment? Well, we've just submitted the ethics application for review, um, and we would aim to start recruiting individuals with RBD, PD, and healthy controls in around three to six months' time. Um, as part of discovery, participants will have been asked whether they'd be interested to receive information about future research studies, um, and those that, that have said yes will be um, invited to take part. Um, so in sort of coming towards the end. Um, hopefully this talk will have gone some way towards explaining um, why it's important to be able to study sleep in detail. Um, thank you very much for listening and hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions you may have.